Thank you all for joining the Business Public Health Virtual Mini Fair today. I'm Tracy Seward. I'm the Senior Director for Outreach and Recruitment at ASPPH, and I'm going to be moderating today's event. We are going to ask that you stay muted with your video off during the formal presentation. You can use the chat mechanism shown here to uh, submit your questions or comments in writing at any point during the webinar. Just click on the chat button at the bottom of your screen and type them into the pop-up box. We'll do a quick general Q&A question after the formal presentations, and then we will split into breakout rooms where you can ask all the questions you want about the specific programs that you came to hear about. You can adjust the layout of your videos at any point as well by set, selecting a speaker view and hide non-video participants by doing that. Uh, you want to change the speaker view, just click view at the top of your screen um, and select speaker view. To hide non-video participants, click on right-click on any participant who does not have their video on, select the three dots in the upper right-hand corner, and then select hide non-video participants. But now I'm excited to welcome all of our schools and programs that have joined us today. The order of the presentations will be Columbia University Mailman School of Public Health. Cornell University MPH program, CUNY Graduate School of Public Health and Health Policy, Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health, Tulane University School of Public Health and Tropical Medicine, University of Arizona Mel and Enid Zuckerman College of Public Health, University of Louisville School of Public Health and Information Sciences, and the University of Nevada Las Vegas School of Public Health. So at this point, I'm going to uh, welcome our first speaker, from Columbia University. Okay, I hope um, everyone can hear me okay. It's telling me to unmute myself. Okay. Great. Okay, well, welcome. Um, my name is Elizabeth Francis. I'm the Assistant Director for Admission and Recruitment here at the Columbia Mailman School of Public Health. So some quick, a quick overview of Columbia. We are one of the oldest schools of public health founded in 1922. We are celebrating our centennial year. Um, so 100 years of educating public health professionals. We're really excited about it. Um, and we are located on 168th Street. That's in the Washington Heights neighborhood of New York City. Uh, most folks are more familiar with the Morningside campus campus, but we are about 40 blocks north, um, up much closer to the George Washington Bridge. So I am going to briefly go through our program, um, but just a couple of quick highlights. Um, you know, we do have a very interdisciplinary education, and we also do what's called IPE. Um, so this is interprofessional education. It's something um, in addition to your practicum, which is your hands-on learning and your leadership classes. Um, this is the next step, right? So being on a medical center, you really do have these um, numerous opportunities for collaboration across different schools. Um, IPE really houses all of that, um, whether it's our IPE day where you'll go through a series of seminars, workshops, or if it's participating in a trip to Puerto Rico, right, to kind of bring all of these different medical insights together um, to help, you know, put some um, knowledge into action. We also have over 25 um, student-led organizations, over 120 leaders, and we do have a really strong foundation um, for diversity and uh, inclusion. In an academic lens, we have a little over 1600 students um, over these five different degree programs. Our most popular degree is an MPH, so it's a professional leadership degree within the field of public health. We also have a master's of healthcare administration, so that's more business management, um, an MS program, and two doctorals, the DRPH and the PhD. When you are applying to our program, you will only be able to apply to one degree in one department. Um, you'll choose from the list of departments here. Um, we offer six different departments and one program in general public health. Um, most of our programs will be considered priority if they are submitted December 1st. This December 1st deadline is also the final deadline for anyone applying to a DRPH or a PhD. Um, and January 15th would be the final deadline for most of our programs. 
So just to dive um, for a quick minute into what it means to be in these different departments. Um, I do place a lot of emphasis when I'm speaking with prospective students that understanding what uh, department is best for you is really the smart um, you know, course of action when you're thinking of applying um, to Columbia. So as you can see underneath all of these pillars, I um, mean, we love our acronyms. So to, to help everyone out, biostatistics, environmental health sciences, epidemiology, health policy and management, population, family health, and sociomedical sciences. Um, under each of these pillars, you can see some of the approaches that they take to public health issues, right? And public health in and of itself is a truly collaborative field. So you'll find a lot of um, reoccurring themes amongst all of them, but you know, definitely these um, kind of siloed columns. Our MPH is the largest degree program. Um, so I just wanna to quickly touch upon the two different curriculum paths for our MPH. The two year is the largest. Um, each student goes to the core. We also do um, a year of integration of science and practice. This is really taking those, um, you know, the, the knowledge and turning them into tangible skills, right? Putting everything into practice. Um, over the summer, you will do your practicum. So that's your hands-on learning experience. And that could be done here in the United States. States. Um, most students like to do their practicum in New York, but it could be anywhere in the country, North America. Um, it could be in Europe, Asia, Africa. It really depends on your interests um, and what you, um, what the framing for your goals are. Our two-year program also is the only program that comes with a certificate. A certificate is like a minor to your major, so it uh, carves out a niche. It allows you uh, to be a little bit more interdisciplinary um, and, once again, be able to cross some of those departments that I spoke about earlier. We also have an accelerated option. Um, what I did leave off of this slide was that the dual students also will follow the accelerated track, so you can see a condensed core um, and no certificate. Happy to speak more about um, dual degree options in uh, the Columbia breakout room. And I know I'm running out of time, so we'll just quickly go over um, these admissions components. Uh, this is pretty generic. You're going to find this across a lot of the programs that you're applying to. Um, we all go through SOFIS um, and, you know, pretty standard. Um, a couple of quick things to point out about Columbia's application process. We are GRE optional. Um, the only department who will be requiring GREs is sociomedical sciences, specifically for their DRPH and PhD program. Otherwise, no test scores are required. Um, it, we do ask that you submit three letters of recommendation. Um, if you are applying within five years of your undergrad, please let one of those letters be from an academic reference. So an advisor, a mentor, a faculty member. Um, that'll be really important. Um, we also require that letters of recommenders submit with professional email addresses. So um, .edu .org. And if not, please email our team. Um, you can also email our team for any questions if you'd like to take out your phone and scan this QR code. We do have our final open house coming up next week, um, next Thursday and Friday. So we hope you can join us, learn a little bit more about the departments, the application process. We do a more thorough view, um, review of admissions and financial aid. Um, so we hope to, to see you there. Thank you. Um, and now I'm gonna turn it over to my colleague, Charlie at Harvard. Oh, no, I'm sorry, not really. I apologize. For now. So sorry. And are you ready to share your screen? I'm having issues on this side. If somebody else wants to jump in. Oh, no problem. We could go um, to the next presenter and come back to you. Yes, that'd be great. Perfect. OK, I think the third is Cooney. Hi, hey, everyone. Good afternoon. One second, let me share your screen. Okay, hi, so my name is Meg Kudish. I am the Director of Admissions at the CUNY Graduate School of Public Health and Health Policy. 
And we are also in New York City. We are in Harlem at 125th Street, in this building right here on the left. And we are a relatively small school. We have about 950 students. About 700 of them are MPH students. Uh, just at like Columbia, most of our students are Masters of Public Health students. And as you will see, many of our programs are online, but we also have many programs that are in person or hybrid. We offer three doctoral programs. They are all in person five masters of public health concentrations, either online or in person or hybrid. It's really flexible. However you wanna study is up to you. We have four masters of science programs, mostly fully online and three fully online certificate programs. So here's a listing of our PhD programs. Most of them do not require the GREs. Um, this one does here, community health and health policy. But I think most of you here are interested in the MPH programs. And so we offer five MPH concentrations. Only the one highlighted in red, epidemiology and biostatistics, requires the GREs. None of the other ones require the GREs. Um, just a note that you can complete these degrees either online or in person, or you can mix and match. And you can apply to all five of them at the same time if you want to, or you can apply to just one. We have admissions committees from each of the programs that review your applications separately, depending on which program you are interested in. So if you don't know if you are, you know, want to do community health or health policy, that's okay. You can apply to both, see where you get in, um, talk to more students and faculty, and then decide where you will finally matriculate. Our four masters of science programs are listed here. They are mostly online except our industrial hygiene program that could be done in person as well and no GREs are required for that program for any of those programs and we have three certificate programs and those are really great because um, you can transfer the courses from the certificate program into your NPH or MS program so if you were not quite sure about public health or you don't really have the background you can do the certificate and then kind of jump into your master's degree as I've said previously, we offer a really flexible schedule. Many of our students work during the day or they're taking care of family members. And so they need that flexibility to pursue their public health degree on their own time. So either online or in the evenings. So that's why we offer these online only programs. And the great thing about the online only programs is that regardless of where you live in the country or the world, you are charged in state tuition. And we'll see what that difference looks like. It's really an affordable degree. But we do have these in-person programs for those who are really more comfortable sitting in a classroom and learning that way. And all those courses are offered in the evening anywhere from 6 to 10 p.m., Monday through Thursday. And you can pursue your graduate degree part-time or full-time, again, as your life allows it. I was um, referring to the in-state and out-of-state tuition. CUNY City University of New York is a state school. And so most of our revenue comes from the state budget. And therefore, a lot our tuition is really, really very affordable. Your MPH degree is only about $26,000 if you're an in-state resident for the entire degree. This is not per year or per semester, or if um, you do it online, okay? We do offer some scholarships though to offset that tuition. We have three great scholarships depending on your background and what degree you are pursuing. Um, there are some caveats and not everyone qualifies for these scholarships but you can find them out on our, our scholarships page that I will link to. And the application process is straightforward. You will hear it from everyone, mostly everyone. It's through SOFAS. You have to apply through SOFAS. We accept applications for the spring and the fall for our NPH, MS, and certificate programs. For the PhD, we only accept applications for the fall semester. But for all the other programs, you can start in the spring or the fall semester. The deadline is approaching if you want to start in January. That deadline is December 1st. But if you're thinking of starting not until the next fall, fall 2022, then you have some time to apply. The deadline isn't until March 1st. And so that's it as a quick overview. Um, I look forward to meeting you in my breakout room and answering more questions. Thank you. I think next up, are we going back to Cornell? Let's try, are you ready, Ben? Yes. Perfect. 
Thank you. Thank you. So my name is Ben Parker. I'm the manager of student services for the Cornell MPH program. Our program is residential only, it's located in Ithaca, New York, on our main campus. We have two concentrations, infectious disease epidemiology and food systems for health. We also have a standard two-year program that has a fall-only start, as well as an accelerated one-year program that is a summer-only start. There is a difference between those programs and who is eligible for them. Our accelerated program is actually a reduced course load, and it's meant for those with an advanced uh, health-related degree, like an MD or a DVM, or a significant amount of post-bachelor's public health fieldwork. Uh, we do have an extremely small class size. There are approximately 20 students in each of our concentrations uh, per year. So we have roughly 40 new students starting in the fall. And our program is dedicated to producing public health leaders of the future. And we do this through an engaged learning approach. Within all of our classes, there are project-based learning that you actually work with our community partners uh, and see your results in action. The other side of our program is built on the applied learning side through our practicum and our capstone that the students do. These are custom tailored to whatever your career goals are and we help our students find the exact situation, the exact experiences that are gonna get them to their, uh, to their career goal. For our coursework, we have core, required courses of 29 credits. These are courses that everyone takes in both concentrations, and this will lead you to become a public health generalist. We also have professional development coursework built in. This is through the courses you take for your practicum, through a colloquium, a speaker series that the students take. This is to help make you a practitioner and a leader. And then you have your concentration specific coursework whether it be the infectious disease epidemiology or the food systems for health along with your capstone and this is to make you a specialist within those concentrations the tuition cost for our program the standard program is two academic years the current tuition is thirty nine thousand four hundred and sixty six dollars you pay that for over the for two years that accelerated program uh, for three semesters the current cost of that over the summer, fall, spring that you'd be attending is $59,199. Admissions requirements, very similar to what everyone else says, it goes through SOFIS. And we also have a small quick application through our graduate school. The deadline for our standard program is May 15th for the fall start and the accelerated because it starts in late May, early June. That deadline is actually earlier, that is April 1st. They are distinguished in two separate entities in SOFIS. And our GRE is optional. Um, in terms of competitive applications, we really look for students who have served, uh, who have worked with underserved areas or come from underserved areas. We also especially pay close attention to your fit for our program and aligning your career goals and aspirations to the mission of our program itself. We require a statement of intent and a statement of purpose. One is to tell us what your career goals are and the other is to tell us how Cornell and the way our program is built will help you achieve them. Those are two things that students really want to pay close attention to. And here you have uh, my contact information as well as our student services assistant Katie Lesser for any further information. And now I'll turn it over to Brian from Hart. Hi there, everyone. Thanks so much for joining today. Share my screen. All right, there we go. Uh, my name is Charlie. I work in the admissions office at the Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health as the associate director. So really work with students as they are considering different programs in public health. Um, and excited to give you a brief overview of our different opportunities today. So looking at the school at a glance, we have just under 1,000 students enrolled at the Chan School, which makes us sort of a medium-sized school of public health compared to some of our peer institutions. 
Within our student body, we have just under 70 countries represented, which makes up about 40% of our student body being from outside the United States. We don't have all quite 50 US states represented in our program, but it varies anywhere from 40 to 45 students or 40, 40 to 45 states rather um, represented each year. So you definitely have the chance to engage with folks from a variety of different geographic locations, both within the US and abroad. Looking a little bit about where we're located, when you think of Harvard, perhaps you think of Cambridge, Massachusetts, and that's where the vast majority of the different schools and colleges of Harvard University are located. We're just south of the Charles River in the city of Boston proper on the Longwood Medical Campus, surrounded by the School of Dental Medicine, Harvard Medical School, a variety of different research hospitals um, and centers. So it's definitely a dynamic and collaborative place to come together to study the field of public health. Looking at our degree programs, we offer a lot of different options. And then within each of those options, we have a lot of different nuance. And on a high level, it just dictates how long a program um, would take if completed full-time, as well as the eligibility criteria. So if you're someone who's current undergraduate student and you're looking to go directly into a master's program, you'd be eligible for our 60 or 80 credit master of science program. These programs require a prior bachelor's degree only. Um, for our MPH programs, similarly, we have a couple different options. We have a 45 credit track, which is one year, and a 65 credit track, which is one and one half years. But for these programs, we are looking for post-baccalaureate work experience. So as you are looking at our different programs across our institutions, just be sure you're really mindful of which um, institutions require work experience versus which recommend versus those that may not have a preference at all, because you will see that vary um, from school to school. At our doctoral program level, we have two options as well, the DRPH, which is more of our practice-based doctoral program, as well as the PhD, which is more of the research-based program as well. So lots of different options, just depending on your interests and your goals. Similar to some of my colleagues, um, when you apply to our program, you not only apply to a degree, um, area, but you also apply to a field of study. So this slide highlights the different opportunities we have as it relates to um, concentrations. You can see some areas like biostatistics, for example, is offered in all three varieties of our Masters of Science, as well as the PhD. You can see other tracks, say health data sciences, for example, is only offered in our 60 credit, which is the one and one half year program. So again, it's just mixing and matching your interests based on eligibility criteria for the programs. For the MPH offerings, uh, we have different fields of study as well, lots of different ways to get involved. Um, and again, you would uh, primarily uh, isolate which area to apply to based on eligibility criteria as it relates to how much work experience you have or any prior um, education you've had as well. Most of our programs are administered on campus in a residential format in Boston. If you are someone who's looking for a distance or hybrid program, we have two options available, which are sort of in the middle of this slide. One of which is our epidemiology program, which is hybrid, so students do the vast majority of programs online, um, but do come to campus for a brief period, while our generalist program is brand new this year and is 100% online for folks that um, know they cannot um, spend time in Boston to study. Um, our requirements are very similar to some of my colleagues who presented, so I won't go into too much depth on this, but we also use SOFIS. And our application deadline is December 1st. So it's the date by which you would need to submit your SOFIS application and happy to answer any other um, school specific questions later on in the breakout room. So thank you very much. And with that, I will hand it over to my colleagues at Tulane. All righty. Hello, everyone. My name is Dylan Hoffpower, and I am an admissions counselor at the Tulane University School of Public Health and Tropical Medicine. I'm excited to get to chat with all of you today. We are the original. We're the first uh, school of public health in the country. We were founded in 1912, and we're at an awesome location right on Canal Street in downtown New Orleans. Um, so I think the city of New Orleans kind of speaks for itself, and I'll talk a little bit more about that in our breakout room. Um, we're at a great ranking um, and we have seven great departments which you can choose from for your, um, for your studies. We have about 1,008 current students and that includes our on-ground students and our online students um, from 50 states and 31 countries. So a really diverse student body um, and about 
860 of those online and on ground are master's students, about 120 are doctoral. Um, so we have a pretty decent sized student body, but once you get into your really uh, program specific courses, the student to teacher ratio is about four to one. So we're able to give you that really individualized attention that you might need as a student at Tulane. Um, as you can see on this slide, we have programs ranging from all areas and sectors of public health. And we have five of our newer uh, online programs that you can pursue in MPHN, which you can see here as well. Um, so whatever you're interested in studying, we have a place for you at Tulane. There is a lot to choose from, and that can be kind of difficult sometimes. And so what I will say about our faculty members is that they're always happy to interact with uh, prospective students like you all. So anytime you would like to speak to someone about one of our programs or departments, we'd be more than happy to set that up. So that is always one thing I like to point out is we are here for you and we wanna to get to know you throughout the application process and even before you submit your application. We do have a holistic admissions review process, which is awesome because we wanna to get to know you, like I just mentioned, as an applicant before you submit your application. So we look at all official transcripts from universities you've attended, um, so make sure you get those in on our application is via SOFIS. Um, we look at your personal statement. We just want you to be genuine. We want to know why you're applying to Tulane, why that specific program and department, um, and how do you feel like earning a degree from Tulane is going to help you achieve your professional goals. Um, and we want to learn about those successes and um, some of the challenges that you've had as a professional or in your educational experience. Um, so specific examples are always great for our admissions committee, and that'll really help you stand out as an applicant, I think, for any school. Um, at least two letters of recommendation if you're applying to one of our master's programs and three letters of recommendation for um, our doctoral PhD applicants. We also look at your resume and we just want to know any professional experience you have, that work experience, volunteer experience, um, if you have some unique educational experience or research, research experience, we want to hear that and um, that helps us to get to know you. GRE scores are currently waived. Um, and and if you feel like yours is competitive, you are always obviously able to include that on your application, but it is not required at this time. So um, for our deadlines, we have a priority application deadline, which means that that will definitely um, consider you for those scholarships. We have a scholarship application as well. So once you are admitted into a program at Tulane, you'll um, gain access to your admitted students portal. And in that portal will be your scholarship application and you will submit um, some more information to us to help us uh, prepare you as a scholarship applicant so that we can show that to that application committee and best select and divvy out those financial awards and merit-based awards. So that scholarship application has its own priority deadline, which you can see on these tables. And then we also follow you know, the final application deadline, which just guarantees that your application will be renewed. All of this information is on our website. Um, and we can talk more about this in our breakout room as well. Something else I'd like to mention, I'm actually finishing up a really cool series I've done, which uh, happens on Facebook Live. And it's a Pathways to Public Health webinar series with some of our uh, faculty members here at Tulane. I have one more today at 1.15 Central Time on Facebook Live. We also add these to our school LinkedIn page and we add them to our um, social media and YouTube page as well. We also have one more virtual open house happening next Tuesday, November 16th. And I'm gonna put the registration link in my breakout room. So even if you just pop in, um, to our breakout room. I'd love to share more and get you registered for our, our open house. Next, I'm going to pass it over to Andre at the University of Arizona. Thank you so much, Dylan. Appreciate that. So let's go ahead and share my screen. Would, would you mind if someone can give me a thumbs up emoji if you can see the screen? Oh, perfect. Thank you, Aaron. All right. Thank you all so much for being here. Uh, my name is Andre Dickerson. I serve as the Assistant Dean for Student Services and Alumni Affair at the Mellon Enid Zuckerman College of Public Health. So grateful to be here. Um, Want to first uh, share that the University of Arizona 
uh, we are actually the only accredited, CEF accredited College of Public Health in the state of Arizona. Uh, and we take honor in that, not only for its representation, but also what it means for the value of the education to our students. Uh, looking at some of the highlights of the college, uh, our faculty and students have the opportunity to focus on chronic diseases, which include diabetes, obesity, cancer, and a number of other areas, as well as um, infectious diseases, which is growing with the number of faculty that we are bringing on. So this gives you a very broad range of uh, a number of things to look into and study and be able to research as you're looking at health disparities uh, across the um, state of Arizona, nationally and abroad. Uh, and you have the opportunity to con conduct and participate in community-based uh, research in that regard. We also have an, an amazing global health initiative program uh, that allows for students to engage uh, abroad and, and, and um, <clears throat> study abroad opportunities, as well as, a, as we mentioned, research opportunities, which is especially beneficial when you're taking into consideration service learning. Uh, we are a middle, medium, uh, mid-sized school of public health, uh, which really is a benefit when you have the opportunity to get hands-on mentorship and support and guidance from faculty. And if nothing else, uh, something that I've found to be true is we have amazing and really good people here. And that's at our faculty, that's what our student services, as well as our administrative leadership. Um, Arizona also is just a really great place to be uh, when you're looking at majority of the year having um, sunshine and opportunities, but also the terrain, uh, the proximity to the border, uh, as well as just different aspects related to public health within the state. Uh, coming to Tucson and being in Arizona tends to offer uh, a lot of opportunities for students when looking for their personal lives and academic life when you're looking to engage the climate as well as the people in the surrounding areas. Uh, so we're going to go into some of our different programs. We'll start with our master's levels programs. We have our MPH program, which is definitely more practice in our professional based degree. And here are the different specializations that you can earn. Um, these are going to be primarily at our Tucson location. So these are in-person MPH programs that are available. However, we do have campuses in Phoenix as well. We have a campus in Phoenix that hosts uh, two MPH concentrations also. Uh, the MPH program is traditionally a two-year program for our full-time students. However, uh, part-time students are absolutely eligible to take up to six years, depending on your personal circumstances, um, especially if you are a professional student hoping to uh, pursue the degree. Similarly, we have our research-based MS program uh, with the concentrations in biostatistics, environmental health sciences, as well as epidemiology for the students who are looking at oftentimes um, serving as a researcher or preparing for a doctoral degree, more specifically a PhD. As we move forward, looking at our doctoral programs, we do offer both PhDs and DRPHs. Uh, looking at the specializations in each, the doctoral degree takes about three to five years to complete for full-time students, taking into consideration two to three for coursework, another one or two for dissertation, and for part-time students, it can take upwards of eight years. Now, the benefit is both of these areas as it relates to the MPH, MS, uh, PhD as well as DRPH. It's going to be our in-person residential programs and we also thankfully offer a fully online MPH as well. Uh, looking at applied epidemiology, health behavior, health promotion, as well as health services administration. This is 100% online throughout the year with seven and a half week courses that actually make it very manageable for the working student. So hopefully if you feel that University of Arizona is a place you're interested in, uh, we can have a program that can be accommodating for you. Looking at our deadlines, uh, we have a December 1 deadline for majority of our programs with the exception of the MPH uh, programs. This, this is all residential as well. Uh, the MPH programs are gonna have a deadline of January 5th. So please note that yes, the December 1 deadline is fast approaching. For those of you who may be interested in the MS, PhD, or DRPH programs, but those of you who are interested in the MPH uh, residential programs, Tucson and Phoenix, 
uh, note that you have just a little bit more time as you're weighing out your options and considering uh, where you may want to attend. Similarly, as we shared, uh, our online MPH program is a year round online. So we admit students in the fall, summer and spring. Uh, we have actually moved back our spring 2022 deadline from November 1 to November 15th. So if there's some of you who are actually still interested uh, in joining and being a part of the uh, spring 2022 cohort, you have a few days. <laughs> uh, and if you do need more support, please feel free to contact um, our online MPH coordinator, which will have their information and more details in our breakout room as well, and we will work with you. Uh, we would do whatever we can to support you and accommodate uh, as best as we can as you continue to explore and make your decisions. As many of my colleagues mentioned, uh, at the moment, GREs are being waived. They are not required for admission. Uh, so if you have taken the GRE, uh, and you have placed uh, above the 50th percentile or a more competitive score, please feel free to include them as we too engage and employ a holistic uh, application review and we'll take them into consideration as they benefit you. However, they are not required. Uh, when we're looking at our financial aid packages, you absolutely, we encourage you to apply for FAFSA as needed. We do have scholarships within the college as well as teaching assistantships that you will be eligible for. Uh, we can answer more of those questions in the breakout room as well. Um, but similarly, when we're looking at uh, financial aid packages, just know that uh, sometimes funding can be limited. And so we do encourage you to seek external funding, but we host and have scholarships for students as well as teaching assistantships that are available to you. The priority are often given to um, for the assistantships to doctoral students because they typically are enrolling in the institution with a higher level degree and credential, and they are actually also investing more time into the studies with the institution. So we want to support them and alleviate as much burden as possible. So one another thing I want to share as we continue on, we're just about completed with the presentation, is if you are a student who currently resides and is a resident of one of these 15 uh, Western regional states. Uh, if you are interested in the residential MPH, MS, DRPH, and uh, PhD program, we will honor the Western Regional Graduate Program and give you in-state tuition. So that allows for you to not play, pay out-of-state tuition if you are a resident of any of these programs. And at the moment, it is being awarded to every student who is applying, who is admitted, and attends and, and matriculates to the college from one of these states. If you have any questions, um, I serve as the primary point of contact for it, um, and I can support you in that process. It's a fairly simple process in terms of you proving uh, your state residency, and we will provide you in-state tuition for your duration that you are uh, in the program. Looking at a snapshot of our tuition and fees, um, this is especially important as we were just talking about the Western Regional Graduate Program. When you're looking at what a full-time Arizona resident is paying versus out of state, it's just over uh, twice the amount. So especially if you are from one of those Western states, it can be a significant benefit of at least close to $20,000 a year uh, for you to consider University of Arizona. But we also, again, support and have scholarships and teaching assistantships for our, our out-of-state and international students that may be looking to attend the university. Uh, just some of our contact information. If you would like, you could take a quick picture of this screen, uh, but we also encourage you to join us during the breakout room as we move forward. And with that being said, I will pass uh, the presentation to my colleague in Louisville. Thank you so much, Andre. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. Just give me a second while I share my screen. There we go. Hello, good afternoon. My name is Deepti Jain and I'm the admissions coordinator senior here at University of Louisville School of Public Health and Information Sciences. Talking about University of Louisville, we are a public university founded in 1798. 
The original School of Public Health at University of Louisville was opened in 1919, making it one of the nation's first public health school. Later on, it was absorbed under the School of Medicine, but we restarted again in late 1990s. University of Louisville is a research one doctoral university and one of the nation's top producer of student Fulbright awards. We have so many Fulbright awardees. One of them this fall 2021 was Shakira Elmore, who will be in the Caribbean islands doing a study in public health there. We are also named best of the best for LGBTQ inclusivity for the sixth time by Campus Pride Index. University of Louisville is home to over 23,000 students from across the United States and over 95 countries. At the University of Louisville School of Public Health, we house approximately more than 600 students for public health programs. Before we move forward, I have a small uh, video here, uh, but I'll have to re-share my screen, sorry, because I, yeah, I was doing that, share screen. Um, sorry about that, here we go. Welcome, I'm Neely Bendapudi, the 18th president of the University of Louisville. I'm so delighted to have a few minutes to talk to each of you and to welcome you to this community. Louisville is known as the compassionate city. We're also a resilient city. We're a city that has great food, great arts, great athletics. We have everything. And I'm so proud to say it's my city. You see, like you, in case you couldn't tell, this is not a Kentucky accent. I grew up pretty far away in India and came to the United States for my higher education. And what I can tell you, that right here, I'm part of the Cardinal family. Louisville is a place that when you come here, you will see people from so many, many different countries, so many states, and the biggest thing you will find is that immediately you're welcomed, you're embraced, and you're made to feel like you've always been here. That's been my experience, and I hope it is yours too. Thank you. That was our president, Dr. Neely Bandhubudi. I really wanted to share this one minute message with you all. Moving forward, well, there's are a few pictures of our campus. I would not do justice with this picture, so I would definitely recommend you visit our website and you can take a virtual interactive tour of our campus. These are pictures of our public health students on field. Last year, they have been super busy working on COVID projects. We have contact tracers. We have people working on books like Economics of COVID-19 right now available on Amazon for purchase. We have students advocating. We have students working with the uh, district councils and health departments working on COVID data. And some of our students were also uh, doing public health projects abroad. We have undergrad and graduate programs both here at the School of Public Health. So these are our undergraduate program. We offer a BS and a BA in public health. We also offer a new track, which is on social justice and health equity. These are our graduate programs. We offer MPH with five areas of concentration, biostatistics, epidemiology, global health, focused on maternal and child health care, health policy and health promotion and behavioral sciences. We also offer a few direct programs for students who are interested in later doing on PhD and doctoral research like MS Epidemiology, MS and Epidemiology, and Health Administration. We also offer a few online programs like Certificate in Biostatistics, a Master's in Biostatistics, and Health Administration as well. Uh, we offer various PhD programs which are focused on public health sciences. We can talk about more about, of our graduate programs in the breakout room. These are the pictures of some of our notable alumni. We have a lot. I just selected a few of my favorites. So where they are working, what they are doing. Uh, one of them is Ellen. Uh, he is a BS public health graduate in 2016. Not right now he's working as a director in performance excellence at Association of State and Territorial Health Officials, Washington, DC. We have Ann Spicer who is working with Apple. I really wanted to highlight that because this is really different out of the healthcare sector. This is our grad, <clears throat> excuse me, data from 2019 to 20 says that 63.7% uh, of our graduates got employed within three months of graduation. Then we have 0% who are actively seeking. We have 27.5% students who are continuing education. 6.9% preferred not to answer. 
MPH admissions requirement. Our requirements are very similar to what all my colleagues have been talking about. We can discuss more about our admissions requirement and MPH as well as other graduate programs in the breakout room. Tuition. Our non-resident tuition is 13,819 approximately per semester, while for resident it's $6,762. For the uh, MPH and the MSHA program, we offer resident tuition to students coming from seven border states of Kentucky. So if you are from Illinois, Indiana, Missouri, Ohio, Tennessee, or Virginia, or West Virginia, you will be paying in-state tuition, not non uh, out-of-state tuition. We offer work opportunities and project for students that can be 20 hours per week, where they will be receiving a monthly stipend as well as tuition benefits. Here are a few of our graduate student funding opportunities that we have. We have a university fellowship, which is especially for doctoral students, where we pay the entire four years of funding for graduate school, which includes your full tuition, stipend, student health insurance. We also offer various assistantship positions like graduate assistants, teaching assistant, and uh, research assistants. All these positions vary as per the department and positions available. We can talk more about graduate funding in the breakout room. These is, this is my contact detail. If you want to contact me directly, you can do it at deepti.gen at louisville.edu. You can also write at our student services email address, which is mentioned here. We also have a virtual uh, meeting booking link on our website. So if you visit our website, that is louisville.edu slash SPHIS, you will be able to book a virtual meeting with one of our counselors. Thank you very much. And I hand it over to Anna from University of Nevada. Thank you for that. Hi, everyone. My name is Anna, and I represent the School of Public Health in the University of Nevada, Las Vegas. Our school is the first CEF accredited School of Public Health in the state of Nevada, and we are also voted the most diverse campus on, in the nation. And I will be sharing my screen right now. Uh, I hope everybody can see that. So our um, programs include a bachelor's in science in public health and also in healthcare administration, a master's in public health and a master's and an executive master's in healthcare administration and a doctorate in public health. We have four concentrations that include social and behavioral health, environmental and occupational health, healthcare administration and policy, and biostatistics and epidemiology. And we are launching our first online option this spring, and it will be a generalist program. Some of our concentrations are required to have an internship, and here are a few of our partners that have worked with our students in the past. We also offer certificate programs that include more advanced courses in public health and in infection prevention. Our admissions requirements are similar to all of my colleagues. We require a 3.0 GPA, your resume, and a personal essay describing why getting a master's at the School of Public Health would benefit you. We require three letters of recommendations just to ensure that you will be a good fit within our program. And so some of our application deadlines are spring application just passed. It was October 1st. However, the fall application will be open in March. We also offer other scholarship opportunities, internship opportunities, and mentorships for our graduate and undergraduate levels. And we also have graduate assistantships. And all of these opportunities require an application. However, they are a great resource for everybody to have for their funding. Uh, if you guys have any questions, you guys can uh, scan the, this QR code to learn more about our school. And if you have any other questions for me, here's my contact information and I will also be available to you in the breakout session. Thank you so much, Anna, and all of the other presenters today. I learned a lot about all of your programs. Okay, so at this point, we are going to um, have a few minutes for general Q&A. Um, if you have questions that pertain to any school or program, that would be the right time to ask this now. If you have something specifically about a, a 
if you have a question that's specific to one school or program, it would be appropriate to ask those in the breakout rooms. So you can use the chat feature to um, message us now. And I will stop sharing my screen so we can invite all the presenters to come back on camera and have a conversation. So um, one question we received is how to make yourself stand out as a great applicant if there's something that you're looking for in an application. I can start. Thank you. I think um, a good idea specifically for Tulane, but probably for any school is to try and meet someone within the program that you're interested in applying for. Um, because first of all, that really helps you to figure out if that's the right program and school for you. But also when the admissions uh, committee, you know, meets and selects their students, however the process works, um, it may be someone that has gotten to know you a little bit better beyond your, you know, paper or online application. So I would definitely say to reach out and uh, more often than not, the faculty members or admission staff members are going to be more than happy and available to meet with you and really get to know you during the time that you're submitting your application. And I think that kind of helps you uh, make yourself known to the school. Great. Thank you. Another question that came in is how long after the application is submitted does it usually take to receive a decision? I can jump I in. And Oh, go ahead. <laughs> I, our answers are likely going to be the same, that you'll you'll get a very different answer from each and every school, depending on their process. Some schools utilize rolling admissions, some schools do not. Um, so for, you know, for us, if you apply by December 1st, we release decisions between mid-February and mid-March. But as I hear, that's kind of late compared to some of our peers. So you, the answer will absolutely vary um, on a high level. But go ahead, DJ, I didn't mean to cut you off as well. No, absolutely. You answered it right. Every school have their own application process and policies. Um, at our school, if I talk about University of Louisville, we will look at your application only when it is complete. So that's the other thing that I would like to highlight. Sometimes you, if you miss on one document or another, then your application will not be processed. So keep an eye on your emails on all the documents required. Great. Um, can we talk a minute about uh, your recommendations and um, whether somebody has to have an edu or .org email address. Um, but I think a broader question is who really is a great person to recommend, make a recommendation for you? I'm happy to jump in um, and answer on a more of a, a broad spectrum. So I think when you're deciding who is the best person to write your letters of recommendation, I think you have to think about the goal, right? This person should write a strong letter speaking about you as a person, your career goals, right? They should know you a little bit. Um, now, whether that's a faculty member, um, a manager, a supervisor, I think that's up to you. Um, but generally speaking, I think, you know, just being very clear in your ask, giving them enough time when you're asking them to, um, they're probably, you know, you might not be the only candidate that they're writing a letter of recommendation for. Um, so being very clear in your ask and, you know, just using your best judgment. Um, they also don't need to be public health affiliated. Um, I think some students get stuck in that sometimes that they need to be centered around healthcare. Check with the schools that you're applying to. For some, it might. Um, but I think you really are looking for just a genuine letter um, to help support the narrative you know, right, um, that you're creating for your application. Excellent, thank you. All right, another question came in um, from somebody with a Bachelor of Agriculture, Animal Science, and wants to know if they're eligible for public health. And I would also broaden this question to say, is there any background that you would say is not an appropriate fit for public health? I can answer that question. Hey. I think any background is appropriate. I have seen students with a background in bachelors of fine arts, bachelors of music, and also engineering, right? Or biology or public health or undergraduate schools um, of public health that grant public health degrees. And so it really doesn't matter um, as much as it matters what program you are applying to. If you're applying to, let's say epidemiology or biostatistics, you need to have a background in some kind of quantitative, um, areas and subjects, right? And, you know, if you're applying to something like community health or maybe more social science-y like health policy um, and things like that, 
um, a more broader background may be more appropriate. So it's not necessarily your background, um, but where you are going with that background and as well as your work experience. You know, if you've been working in the area of public health for the past 10 years, that is going to have a big effect on your application and how um, well you'll be received by the admissions committee. So I say apply definitely with that background. Um, the GREs, you know, as you heard, some schools are looking at the GREs, some schools are not. For some, it's optional. If you feel that your GREs are good, then include them. And um, yeah, good luck to you. Thank you. All right, one last question um, before we hop over, but this has been asked a by a couple different people, but IELTS scores, um, they have a two-year expiration date. So if they are uh, more than two years old by the start of the application process or the start of the um, enrolling date, what, what are you all looking for? What's the cutoff date for eligibility? Uh, for our deadline, it's two years from our application date, not the start of the term you're applying for. So 2019 right now would be the cutoff. Okay. All right, a couple of um, quick thing, housekeeping. People have been asking about the recording. We will make that available after. Um, and also there was a question about um, a SOFA specific one. Uh, letters of recommendation are one of the things that are common among all of the applications. So recommenders only need to submit one. It should be generic and not say that they are recommending you to a certain school or program because every school or program you apply to will see that. Okay, I'm gonna share my screen one last time. All right, so we do have another virtual fair coming up next week. It's a different format. You'll We have over 75 uh, schools and programs participating. You'll have the chance to chat with all of them. And we also um, have a very active social media accounts through This Is Public Health. So it's a great way to see what's happening in public health. We have social, uh, This Is Public Health ambassadors who take over our social media on almost a weekly basis. So you can really learn about a lot about what our students are getting involved in and what kinds of careers they hope to have in, in the areas they're passionate about. Also this, um, as you continue to do your homework about where you wanna attend and how you will pay for it, ASPPH does have um, three really great resources for you. So I would recommend you check them out. They can all be accessed through ASPPH.org. That's our financing your degree page, which is a scholarship database. Um, we have the academic program finder, which is a way for you to search for programs that are uh, that meet your interests, and also the view book, which you can sign up for and just learn a little bit more about these schools and programs. All right, without further ado, we're going to open the breakout room. So if the presenters want to head over first, what I, I will describe, you have the opportunity to select your own breakout room. And uh, if you have any issues joining it, we can help you get to where you need to be. But otherwise you can hop, hop around for the next hour and get all your questions answered by all of the schools and programs. And I will be hanging out here for the entire hour if you have any questions or need any help. Thank you.